Good morning, everyone. Welcome on this fine morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please make your way in, stand and join us as we sing. This is Psalm 57, verses 7 through 9. My heart is steadfast, O oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory, awake, O oh harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations.
take a moment and greet those around you. Good morning, everyone. Make your way in and grab a seat. Welcome. Welcome to this gathering of Eastgate Alliance Church. It's good to be together to worship this morning. Thank you for joining us. And let me begin our time of worship with this invitation. To all who are weary and in need of rest this morning, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who mourn and are longing for comfort, and to all who sin and need a savior, we want to welcome you with the open arms of Jesus Christ himself, the friend of sinners, because it's in his name that we've gathered together this morning uh, during these uh, four Sundays before Christmas, these Sundays of Advent, we look forward, we look back to the, the first Advent, the first coming of Christ, and we look forward to his second coming. And we, we ponder together, we meditate together on the coming of the light. Jesus is the light of the world. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And therefore, we have hope. So that's what we're here to celebrate together this morning. Um, but before we continue in worship, let me just uh, make you aware of a few announcements. Uh, the main one is that today, this afternoon, at 4 o'clock, is our annual Christmas party. So there are... Um, these sheets out on the welcome table out there that's got information about everything I'm about to tell you. Um, but this afternoon at 4 o'clock, um, we are getting together out at Steckert Sleigh Rides, which is in Chile. The address is here on this sheet. Um, so it's about, it's near Chile. Um, so we're getting together at 4 o'clock for a sleigh ride. I don't think there's actually enough snow for there to be a true sleigh ride, but there will be a horse-drawn wagon ride at least. Um, so we go on uh, these beautiful wagon rides, and then we get together for food afterwards. So it's, this is a potluck dinner, so if you can bring food with you to share, that would be great. Um, there are outlets there for slow cookers and everything like that. Um, but if you, we would love to invite you all to come, and uh, there's no cost. You don't need a ticket. You don't need to register or anything. Just show up. Um, and I will say that the rides get colder as the day goes on. So if you want to come before 4 o'clock, that would be even better. You can show up at 3.30. Basically, as soon as there are enough people to fill up a wagon, the rides will start, and they'll keep going until everyone has gone once. So if you want to come early, um, we could get the rides started earlier, and that would be better for you, um, because obviously, um, by 5 o'clock, the sun will be down, and the rides will still be going if uh, people haven't all been yet, but they will get colder as time goes on. So you're all invited to come. If you come, if you can bring food with you, that would be great, and also dress warm, okay? Uh, inside the barn, there's going to be a, a fire, and it won't be freezing cold inside the barn, but on the rides, it'll be pretty cold, so make sure you dress warm, bring a blanket with you, uh, and that would be great. So you're all invited. If you have any questions about that, um, just feel free to talk to me or to Pastor Aaron or anyone else after the service. Um, as well, I want to let you know that next Sunday, the 17th at 2 p.m., we're getting together to uh, pass out... Um, gift bags throughout the, the houses throughout uh, around the church building. So we would love to have your help with that. If you could come at 2 p.m., uh, we're going to be downstairs in the multi-purpose room putting together 300 of these gift bags and then distributing them through the neighborhood. So if you can help with that, we would love to have your help. And then on the 24th, it's Christmas Eve. So we'll be having our regular worship service at 1030 and then an evening candlelight service at 5 p.m. So that's on the 24th. We would love to have you come, invite friends, invite family, and we'll be celebrating the birth of Christ together. All right, I think that's all the announcements that I have. Um, if I forgot something, I'll let you know later. I have the nagging feeling that I did. But let me invite Logan up as we continue in worship for these Advent Sundays. With our scripture readings, we are lighting candles on the Advent wreath as well. So let me invite Logan up for, to read God's word to us this morning. Good morning, church family. For the second day of Advent, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. 
We light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ. <clears throat> the reading for today comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 9. Comfort, comfort my people, says our God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her, that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she is received from the Lord's hand, double for all of her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain hill will be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry. And I said, Why shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Come, Lord Jesus, our light and our salvation. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we gather together this morning to give thanks to your name, to praise you, because you are the God who is faithful to your promises. So, Lord, we thank you for the coming of Jesus, the light of the world. Lord, we're thankful that at the right time, you sent your son into this world. And, Lord, we thank you for the promise that we have that he will come again, and that when he comes again, he will destroy all evil and he will save his people, and that we will live in a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Lord, we, we look forward to that day with longing and anticipation, and I pray that as we worship this morning, you would stir up that longing within us. God, we pray that you would um, help us to look to your promises with faith. And so, God, I pray that as we sing and as we pray and as we hear your word, Lord, that you would stir up our hearts and that you would help us to praise you and worship you in spirit and in truth. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. with me 
Kids are dismissed for Children's Church. 
Uh, let me invite you to declare what we believe together using these words from 1 Corinthians 15. So let me invite you to join your voices with, ma- with mine as we uh, declare this good news together. This is the good news that we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen? Amen. Well, kids, you can be dismissed for Children's Church. Oh, and I remembered what I forgot to announce before. We are having a baptism service on January 7th. So if uh, you are interested in being baptized or if you want to just know more about that, if you have questions about that, um, come and talk to me or talk to Pastor Aaron after the service, and we would love to talk with you more about that. So that's what I forgot. It was bugging me that whole time. It finally came to me. All right, so let's pray. And then we'll go to God's word together. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we remember the good news this morning that gives us hope. Lord, it's because Christ has come that we can know you. Lord, we never could have found our way to you. Lord, we are in darkness unless you send us light. And that's what you did. Lord, you sent us Jesus, the light of the world, your only son, to bring us back to you. And so, Lord, we give thanks this morning for the good news that there is a light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So, Father, we pray for all who are in this congregation who are suffering through different kinds of darkness. Lord, the darkness of grief, darkness of depression, the darkness of physical illness, or, Lord, any kind of darkness. Lord, we pray that the light of Christ would give them hope this morning, would encourage them, would lift up their spirits. Lord, we pray that we as a community would be a community of hope. Lord, a community that cares for one another, lifts up one another, bears one another's burdens, and a community that reaches out beyond ourselves, beyond these walls to those around us. Lord, we pray for the Christmas party this afternoon that you would keep us safe as we travel to and from, and that you would give us a good time of fellowship together. Lord, we pray for the outreach next Sunday, God, that, um, Lord, the gifts that we share with our neighbors, the, um, Lord, and especially the, the good news, the Gospels of John and the other booklets that will be in those gift bags, Lord, that, um, you would work through those, those small things, and that you would bring light to the darkness in this neighborhood. God, we pray that you would prepare hearts ahead of time, and Lord, that maybe that gift would meet someone at just the right time, and Lord, that they would know that there's no no coincidence there, but that you know them and see them and love them, and Lord, that you would bring them to yourself. So Lord, we pray for this community as well, Um, God, we thank you for the beautiful things in our community, things like the Nutcracker, things like fun community events. Um, But Lord, we also pray because we know that there is a lot of brokenness in our community. And so God, we, we ask for you to be gracious to us. And Lord, we ask that you would help us as your church to know how we have been called to be your ambassadors. Um, Lord, help us to know what it means to be ambassadors of hope to those around us. And God, I pray that you would prepare us for that as we look to your word now. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, you would remind us of the hope that we have in Christ, and Lord, that you would, Lord, you would help us to know what you have to say to us. God, I pray that you'd give us open hearts, give us open ears, give us a a posture of humility as we come to your word. Lord, you said that the one to whom you will look is is the one who is humble before your word and trembles before your word. So God, I pray that you would create that, that spirit of awe and humility before us as, as we listen to you. And Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Well, let me invite you to turn in a Bible to the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 1. If you want to grab one of the Bibles in front of you in the back of the pew, follow along. It's on page 801. And this year, the prophet Malachi is our Advent guide over these four Sundays leading up to Christmas. Um, And remember, Malachi was a prophet who was sent to God's people in Israel uh, 2,500 years ago, around the year 460 B.C. The people of Israel had returned from exile in Babylon. They were back in the land. They'd rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, rebuilt the temple. And yet it was a discouraging time that Malachi was speaking into. It was a time of corruption, a time of um, spiritual darkness, a time of discouragement. And so God sent Malachi with a message of, a message of, uh, a hard message, a message of repentance, but ultimately, ultimately a message of hope, a message of inviting the people to spiritual renewal. And the last, the, the thing we saw last week, the beginning of Malachi's message is that the very first thing that God had to say to his people Israel is, I have loved you. I love you. Despite everything that has gone on in the past, despite everything that's going on right now, I love you. I still love you. I've chosen you. I'm for you. And nothing will ever change that. Um, If you're a parent, you know that nothing can ever make you stop loving your kids, although they test us at times, although that resolve, that commitment might be tested sometimes, you know that there's nothing your kid could do uh, that could make them stop loving you. And no matter what terrible choices they make, no matter what a mess they make of their lives, um, parents never fail in their love for their kids. And that was God's attitude toward Israel. And that's really why he goes on through the rest of the book of Malachi to speak some hard words to Israel, his, his children, um, his chosen people. He says, um, you know, in Hebrews 12, it says that the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. And that's why God is um, going to speak some hard words in the passage we're going to say today, and the passage we're going to read today. He's going to speak some hard words to his people because he loves them and he's calling them to return. And really, that's the Advent invitation to all of us. Um, you know, during this time leading up to Christmas, this Advent season, we look back to what God has done for us in Christ. We look forward to what God will do when Christ returns. Um, and we examine ourselves in the meantime. And we have this opportunity right now to ask ourselves, how might God be calling us to return to him? What is the the renewal that maybe we need to experience. So keep that in mind as we read God's word to the people of Israel through his prophet Malachi. We're going to read starting in uh, chapter 1, verse 6, and we're going to read all the way down to chapter 2, verse 9. This is what God says. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations." And in every place, incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, and its fruit, that is, its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering, Shall I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? 
Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring, and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with, with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you've turned aside from the way. You've caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts, and so I make you despised and abased before all the people inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. This is God's word. Now, there are some hard words in there, huh? Um, so remember, in the book of Malachi, there are these six disputations. That's how the book is structured. There are these six disputations, these six arguments where God says something to his people they contradict it, they argue back, and then God gives them proof of what he's just said. So this is the second of those six disputations, this whole section, and you probably noticed it's directed mainly uh, not at the people in general, but at the priests of Israel. And so what's God's message to them? Uh, look at chapter 1, verse 6. His basic message to them is, um, you have despised my name. You know, where is my honor? Where is my fear? You have despised my name. You're dishonoring me. You're, you're not treating me as I deserve. And then the priest responds to God in verse 6. How have we done that? How have we despised your name? God, no, we haven't done that. Uh, how could you say that? We're not despising your name. Look at all we're doing for you. But God gives them the proof in verse 7. He says, you're despising my name. By the sacrifices you're offering, by offering polluted food upon my altar. In verse 8, he talks about how you're, you're offering blind animals in sacrifice. You're, you're bringing animals that are lame or sick to sacrifice. And so, I know we're entering the, the weird world of animal sacrifice in the Old Testament. It's sort of a foreign world to us. Um, but the basic idea was, when you brought an offering to the temple, when you brought an animal to sacrifice, um, you were supposed to bring your best. Right? That was... That was what God told his people to do in the Old Testament law. He said, when you bring an animal to sacrifice, um, it can't be blind, it can't be crippled, it can't be sick. You're supposed to bring the very best from your herd. Um, because that was a way of showing honor to God. Uh, you didn't just bring him your leftovers. You didn't bring him the animals that you didn't need anymore, you didn't want anymore. Um, you honored God, you worshiped God by bringing him your first and your best of all that you have. And so the problem that Malachi is confronting in this passage is that the priests weren't insisting that the people bring their best, right? The priests were the ones who offered up the sacrifice on the altar in the temple, and the people were bringing these animals, and they were saying, the priests were saying, oh, you, you brought a blind goat? Sure, let's sacrifice that. Oh, a three-legged lamb? Sure, why not? Let's, let's throw that on the altar. You know, this, this ox that's half dead? Yeah, that'll do. Sure, let's, let's sacrifice it. And so in the way that the priests were overseeing these sacrifices, um, they were dishonoring God. They were despising his name. And so God is telling the priests in, verses, in chapter 1, verses 6 to 14, I don't want your leftovers. <laughs> He's saying to them... <laughs> You're dishonoring me and how you are bringing these sacrifices. So that's what he's saying in chapter 1. In chapter 2, in those verses we read, is another way that the priests were dishonoring God's name. Because the priests weren't just responsible for overseeing worship in the temple, for offering sacrifices. They were also responsible to be the teachers. They were the teachers of God's law. And uh, they weren't honoring God's name in the way they taught the scriptures either. So... Um, God points, him to, points them to the example of their forefather, Levi. So all of the priests 
were from the tribe of Levi. They're all descended from Levi. And uh, God says that Levi was the ideal priest. He was a good priest because in chapter 2, verse 5, Levi stood in awe of my name. Um, really, that, that's what qualified you to be a priest, not just your lineage, not just your heritage, but your, your posture towards God, your attitude towards God. You, priests were to stand in awe of God's name and how they led worship and how they taught the scriptures was supposed to reflect that to the people. But that wasn't what was going on. In chapter 2, verse 8, he says, um, not only have you turned aside from the way, but you've caused many other people to stumble by your instruction. And so you've corrupted the covenant. And therefore, God is warning them. He's rebuking them. And there's a lot in this passage that we can't look at. Um, I don't think I'm really going to say a whole lot about dung on faces. <laughs> I apologize. I know that was the part you were really looking forward to. Um, there's a lot in here we're not going to talk about. But in the time that remains, I do want to ask four basic questions of this passage. Um, what is it telling us about God? What is it telling us about ourselves? How is it pointing us forward to Christ? And how should we respond to this? So, first, um, what is this passage telling us about God? Really, what, what it's telling us about God is that the priests and the people of Israel were really what they were suffering from. The problem beneath all of their other problems was a low view of God. Right? They didn't fear him. They didn't stand in awe of him. They didn't respect him. To, to them, God was just, oh, he's our friendly neighborhood deity. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter the way that we worship him. Um, the, the worship of God, the way that they approached God reflected their low view of him. Really, the, the way that they worshiped God in the temple um, was like the way that we go to the Rotary Winter Wonderland here in town. Have any of you been to the, the lights at the zoo this year? You know how when you go, um, you, you're supposed to bring a donation, right? They're, they're uh, collecting donations for the food bank. So you bring a, a food item or you bring a, you know, a cash donation. Um, and so confession time, what do you bring with you when you go to the lights at the zoo? <laughs> do you look through your pantry ahead of time and you find the, the best of what you have in your pantry? Do you bring that? Um, or do you bring that old can of refried beans, <laughs> from 2005 that you find in the back of your pantry. Um, when you go to the lights at the zoo, do you put you know, that $20 bill from your wallet in? Or do you quick look in your coin box in your car and grab out the nickels and the pennies and, you know, so that you can put something in that'll make a sound so they know you gave something, but you know, it doesn't really cost you that much, okay? I've done that, okay, so there's no condemnation here. Um, but. You know, what you bring to the zoo at the end of the day is really not that big of a deal for the Rotary Club. You know, they will take your leftovers because at the end of the day, they need all the help they can get, right? Um, and so, you know, they're not going to turn you away at the door for bringing less than your best uh, because something's better than nothing. But look what God says to the priests in chapter 1, verse 10. <laughs> he says to the priests, Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors to the temple, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept these kinds of offerings from your hand. You see what God's saying? He's saying, shut the doors to the temple. If this is how you're going to come, then you might not come, then it's better off if you don't come at all. If you can't be bothered to bring me your best, then don't bother at all. I would rather the temple be closed for business than have your leftovers. See, God is saying to the priests and to his people, I'm not hungry. <laughs> That's not what this is about. I don't need anything from you. I don't need your sacrifices because God's not a beggar. He doesn't, he doesn't need anything that uh, we have to offer him. He's not sitting there hoping that someone will notice him, hoping that someone will throw him a bone, hoping that someone will help him out. Um, he says in verse 14 of chapter 1, I am a great king, and my name will be feared among the nations. In Psalm 50, it tells us that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If, if he were hungry, he wouldn't tell us. <laughs> uh, he doesn't need anything from us. Um, he's, not, he's not after anything that we have to offer him because he needs it. 
right? The sacrificial system was not about feeding God. That wasn't, that wasn't the purpose behind the sacrifices. And that's not why we worship either. Uh, worship is not our way of filling up what's lacking in God. Worship is the way that we respond to God's glory and God's majesty. It's the way that we display his, his value and his worth. He doesn't need our leftovers. He doesn't want our leftovers. And so what does this passage teach us about God? He's a great king and he's to be worshipped wholeheartedly or not at all. Now, second question, what does this passage teach us about ourselves? Well, it teaches us that we uh, naturally tend towards half-heartedness in worship. Um, isn't that what, what this, picture is a, this passage is a picture of? Right? This is a picture of half-heartedness. Because they hadn't stopped coming to the temple, right? They were still going to the temple. They were still bringing sacrifices. They were still doing all the religious stuff. It's not like uh, worship had ceased. And yet, um, their hearts weren't in it. They were just going through the motions, right? They were just saying, all right, well, it's time to go to the temple again. Let's just find something to bring with us. It doesn't really matter what it is. We just need to have something. Their heart, they were just going through the motions. And every married person in here knows that, um, you know, marriage can be like that. <laughs> uh, marriage starts off with this, you know, great excitement and passion. And then as time goes on, we naturally slide um, towards half-heartedness in marriage, right? The, the, the excitement begins to wear off. And if that natural slide isn't countered or corrected, if you don't do something about it, eventually you find yourself in the situation where you're just going through the motions, right? You're, you're still married. You still do married people stuff. You live in the same house. You send a Christmas card together. Um, and yet, it's just going through the motions, and in the same way, our relationship with God um, naturally slides toward half-heartedness. Sometimes we find ourselves in that situation where, you know, we still go to church, we still sing the songs, we still, on a good day, manage to stay awake during the sermon. Um, you know, we might serve in a ministry, we might bring an offering, and yet, if we're honest, um, we're just going through the motions. And so sometimes we find ourselves saying the same things that the Israelites said. You know, in verse 13, what a weariness this is. What a weariness. Um, because if we're honest, sometimes we're bored, right? We're bored with God. We're bored with church. We're bored with the gospel. Um, we still believe, you know, we still, we still believe in God. And yet, um, we're just going through the motions. And the proof is in our worship, in our um, not in what we do necessarily, but in our, our heart posture towards God. We, we're not putting God first. And that shows up eventually in our lives. We don't put God first with our time, with our money, with our priorities. We give him what we have left over, right? The things that we don't need anymore, the things that we don't want anymore. Um, and you know what? I can't let myself escape from this passage because this passage is directed toward the leaders of Israel, right? And so sometimes the people in the pews are bored with God because the pastors are bored with God. Um, sometimes um, churches are bored with God because, and they are going through the motions because that's what they've been conditioned to do by their spiritual leaders. They've been taught and they've been given the example um, that the leftovers are good enough for God. And what I'm saying here, I'm not talking so much about a feeling. I'm not talking about an emotional state. Um, I'm not saying that if, you know, if you don't feel this electric sense of God's presence every time you open the Bible or every time you pray or every time you come to church, that you're doing something wrong, right? That you're, uh, you're not worshiping God wholeheartedly. I'm, I'm not talking about feelings. I have no agenda in saying this, like, you know, um, I want you all to raise your hands when you sing or, you know, here's this Christmas offering that we're going to be collecting. I, I don't have any... Um, I don't have anything I'm driving at here besides the, the attitudes of our heart towards God. Um, in our hearts, are we honoring God as holy? Um, you know, that's, that's sometimes more difficult to discern than an observable action, but I think we know when it's there, when, when we're going through the motions. Um, in our lives, are we giving honor to God's name, or are we treating him lightly? 
So that line from verse 10 um, has really kind of haunted me this week, where God tells the priests, oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors. And so I'm wondering if God sent a prophet uh, to the American churches, um, to God's people here, um, would God say that to any of our churches? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors. Stop the music, stop the preaching, turn off the live stream, uh, cancel the Sunday services, either worship me with your whole heart or not at all. So someone once asked Jesus this. Um, someone asked Jesus, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And you remember what Jesus said. He said to him, in Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. All the law and the prophets. Everything in the Old Testament. Everything in Malachi. Everything in Isaiah. All that stuff in Leviticus about sacrifices and rituals and cleanliness. It's all driving at this. Love God with everything you have and with all that you are. That's, the, that's what God requires. Which means we're in trouble, right? <laughs> um, because we're not wholehearted. We're, we're half-hearted in our approach to God. Um, there are days when I don't love God very much. And I'm guessing there are days um, where you don't love God very much either. And so if this is God's standard, um, we're in trouble. So what's the solution to our unworthy worship? Um, you know, what's, what should we do about this? Let's really sing this last song. Come on, guys. Maybe sing it out. <laughs> or let's all, let's all put a little more on the offering plate on our way out today. Um, or let's all, collectively, let's all resolve that in 2024, we are really going to love God. This is our year. We're really going to do it this year. No, we're not saved by our love for God. The good news is that we're saved by God's love for us. That is to say, we're saved by grace not by works of the law. And so the problem in this passage that Malachi is surfacing here is the problem of unworthy priests bringing blemished sacrifices that were brought by half-hearted worshipers, right? And the Bible's answer to that problem is not try harder. The Bible's answer to that problem is Jesus Christ. So how does this passage point us forward to Christ? Um, the rest of the Bible goes on to tell us how Christ came at Christmas, to be our priest and to be our sacrifice. So in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews says that since the Old Testament law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Every priest stands daily at God's service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. <laughs> so you see what that passage is saying about Jesus? It's saying that Jesus is our priest. He's the one who offers up the sacrifice on our behalf. Um, and that sacrifice that he offers up is once and for all. It's a, a sacrifice once for all time that uh, cleanses us perfectly. And what is the sacrifice that our priest brings? The sacrifice is himself. He is both the priest and the sacrifice. That, that's what happened on the cross. Jesus, our priest, offered up the sacrifice of himself to deal with our sin. Jesus, it says there in, in Hebrews 10, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified because he is the perfect priest that succeeds where all those other priests failed, and he is the perfect sacrifice that we never could have come up with. And so he is the one who perfects us. We are being sanctified. We are being remade. We're being changed from the inside out into people who truly love God and love our neighbor from the heart. Not perfectly, but truly. And friends, that is good news. 
right? Regarding our salvation, there is nothing more that needs to be done that Christ has not accomplished when he died and when he rose again. And that's why salvation is offered to us today as a gift. It's freely offered to us by God in grace. It's freely received by us in faith. And so how should we respond to Malachi's message? Yeah, Um, how should we as Christians, as those who have received this gift, and maybe there are some here who haven't received this gift, and that's the way that you should respond, by receiving Christ by faith, the one who does what you can't do to bring you back to God. But for those of us who have received that gift, um, you know, we're Christians living on this side of the cross. How should we respond to Malachi's message to them back then living on the other side of the cross? Um, Should we say, well, uh, this passage doesn't apply to me. Uh, The sacrifice of Christ means we don't have to make sacrifices anymore, right? Jesus paid it all. Um, Well, yes and no. You're right in the sense that Yeah, that's not how we worship God today, um, by bringing animal sacrifices. Um, There's no altar on the church property where we offer up bulls and goats and lambs um, because we we live under a new covenant. So you're right, we we are not called to offer sacrifices in that sense. Um, But no, you're wrong because we are still called to offer offer sacrifices. Do you know that the, uh, the New Testament calls believers in Christ redeemed by grace to offer sacrifices to God? You know what those sacrifices are? Um, Look at Hebrews chapter 13. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say, Through Christ, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Don't neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So Jesus came uh, not just to save us, but to change us from the inside out. And in Christ, by the power of his spirit, he can make us into people who truly love God with all of our hearts so that our lives overflow with praise, the sacrifice of praise. And through the power of his Holy Spirit in us, Christ can make us into people who truly love our neighbors as ourselves and, and do good to them. That's the, sacri- the other sacrifice it talks about in Hebrews 13, the, uh, the sacrifice of doing good to others. And so these are the sacrifices that are pleasing to God. These are the sacrifices that we are called to, this is how we're called to worship God, by our praise to him and by our service and our good works towards others. And so the question for us is this, when we consider Um, that call from God, Um, are we giving God our leftovers, or are we giving him our first and our best? Are we truly doing our best to honor God with our lives, or are we going through the motions? And so this passage ought to be for us, people redeemed by grace, safe in the Father's hands, uh, called and secure. Um, It ought to be for us, the new covenant people of God, just as it was for them, the old covenant people of God, uh, a call to repentance and rededication and renewal. God doesn't need anything from us. <laughs> That's not why he called us, because he needed something from us, because he wanted anything that we have to offer. And yet, by his grace, he has called us. So how then should we live? And that really is the Advent question. Because huh? here we are, we're living between the now and the not yet, between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And the question is, what sort of people ought we to be as we live in light of Christ's coming and as we wait for him to come again? That's that's the invitation to us in these days leading up to Christmas to ponder that question. And let me close with this from uh, Titus chapter 2. The Apostle Paul gives us this guidance. He says, For the grace of God has appeared in the past, first advent of Christ, when Christ was born, and what he did brought salvation for all people. So, the grace of God has appeared in the past, bringing salvation for all people, training us right now in the present to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. As we're waiting for something yet to come, we're waiting for our blessed hope, 
the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, why? To redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So let's pray that God would do a work of grace among us and he would make us people who love him and love others truly from the heart. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we come before you as people who know that we stand in need of your mercy. Lord, we confess that in the way that we live our lives, um, we haven't given honor to your name as we should. Lord, we confess um, that sometimes we have been guilty of that, of despising your name in the way that we treat you and in the way that we treat others. God, we confess that we haven't loved you with our whole heart, and we haven't loved our neighbor as ourselves, and there is no health in us. And so, Lord, we confess that to you, and we ask, according to your promise, that you would help us to change. Lord, we pray that you would remake us from the inside out. God, I pray that you would help us to look to Christ, our salvation, As our sanctifier, Lord, the one who can teach us what it means to love. Lord, Jesus Christ is the only person who has ever lived, who has loved you with all of his heart, and he can teach us, and by the power of his spirit, he can help us to do the same. So, Lord, I pray that um, for those of us here who are, who maybe are just going through the motions, um, God, that you would reach out to us and that you would call us to repentance and renewal. And that you would help us to walk in light of Christ's coming with great joy, great confidence, and great love. Lord, we ask that you would do this for the glory of your great name. Amen. Let's stand again.
behold the glory of our King forever. died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again, and therefore we have hope. So go with this blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Go in peace.